it was just very interesting to hear Sam's presentation and also Asa. And I always, um, then I want to kind of engage with what was said. So I, I kind of like have to fight the temptation to uh, change all my presentation to link it. But I think I'm going to try to point to some things that were said because um, there are things that resonate and they were really not part of the talk. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about me. I am from Uruguay originally, the same country that Samuel is, and where I live now, I moved there one year ago. I, before that, I lived for 16 years in London, and most of my uh, art education happened in Europe. I did the first year in the school that Samuel is the director when I was 18. Uh, that, that experimental program that you saw, I went through that uh, and then I moved to Spain. I trained as a wood carver and a gilder, so I had technical education in like crafts. And then I moved into conceptual art, <laughs> which is quite a dramatic shift from wood carving and gilding to uh, conceptual art and performance, but um, it made political sense to me. And uh, uh, gradually I, I gravitated towards um, performance and what is now called social practice, uh, where really I started to work in that manner in the late 90s as part of a group of artists that in London we were coming out of the tradition of performance art and conceptual art that really concerned with forms of self-organization, of self-directed activity, of finding, creating spaces and, and publics to work with outside of uh, what was the institutional setup for art that was very um, heavily around video, art, and installation in that period, of, uh, you know, the, the late 90s. Uh, that type of practice became institutionalized in time, and uh, you uh, probably, I, I hope that you know what I mean by social practice. Uh, it's a kind of um, thing that, that fear, that dinner party fear question when they tell you, oh, you're an artist, what type, type of work you do? And you're not a painter, you're not a sculptor. And if you just try to go into an explanation of <coughs> what you do, it's just uh, you ruin the dinner party. So um, <laughs> what I do now is I say, I am a conceptual community artist. I find that this is quite an accurate description because I work in community settings, but I use conceptual art strategies. Uh, in the context of my doctoral research, I have come to a contextual definition that is a community-based art practice, and that's, there's a long argumentation in the dissertation about why, why I chose that term. And then, I guess, in a wider art context like here, I would just refer, I'm okay with the term social practice. Um, the Pablo Olguera's book, sorry, I'm touching the wrong computer. Uh, Pablo Elguera uh, book was published in 2012, so it's quite a recent book. It's the first book that is um, first book that is published on the topic of how you might teach this type of practice, and um, I find that interesting that in the introduction he he refers to the term social practice, and 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 he kind of like um, positively assess the fact that uh, the word art has been dropped out of the title. And he understands that this is a, th that, that kind of like the dropping of the term, the term obscures the discipline from which socially engaged art has emerged. And uh, he understands that this dropping of the word art is an attempt to move away from the understanding that we have of art and the role of artists, uh, both in the modernist and the postmodernist tradition, and to move it closer to other fields, or other disciplines like ethnography, sociology and indeed education. However, he chooses to call his name Education for Socially Engaged Art, uh, not social practice, although he makes a positive appraisal of the term. And I find that, um, that he doesn't explain why he does that, but in my experience of having worked in this field since the uh, mid-90s, socially engaged art is a term I don't like. For me, it relates to institutional practice institutionally endorsed practice the, to the commissioning process, this, um, this understanding, uh, it's, uh, it has been noted too in the doctoral research of uh, both Sophie Hope and Judith Stewart, who were the two PhDs that are the, one of the, some of the few examples of doctoral research on this type of practice. And they have, um, they have also identified the term socially engaged uh, art practice as intrinsically linked to the commissioning process and to a professional form of practice that uh, seeks actively to engage with the art world. Um, I think for me, precisely, that 
uh, affiliation with uh, commission institutionalized practices, what I don't like the term. Uh, pa pa Pablo Elguera is a Mexican artist. Uh, he's the director of adult education programs at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So he's an art educator. And I guess that that kind of explains his alliance to a term that is linked to institutional practices. That's the context in which he uh, works. So this is a little bit of a definitional diversion, but I think it's, you know, it sets the, the basis for what I'll talk uh, later. I uh, usually, when I talk about my work, I, what I do is I pick one project and or my one work and I go through it in quite a lot of detail, but uh, for the sake of being able to talk about the, the pedagogical things that might happen around it, uh, I'll just show you a short clip um, that was done for uh, a project that I was persuaded to do in Switzerland by um, a couple of artist curators who um, kind of like uh, hustled me into coming to the village and do a project, although <laughs> I, in 2007, I decided I was not going to work uh, on commissions and I was not going to work in communities that were not the ones that I was already part of. They were very persuasive. They came to see me in London. They offered me a lot of um, fun in the village and I kind of liked them and I went to have a look and I ended up embroiled in this thing that was quite weird. So they asked me to make a little video talking, presenting to the Finners, the villagers in Switzerland, my work. And uh, it was quite a good exercise for me to try to summarize what I, in my mind, is quite complex into three minutes. So I just play that to give you an idea of where, you know, my imaginary whereabouts it is. Oh, can you, oh how do I do with this? What do I do with this? Um, uh, there. I don't know if the sound is going to work. Click what? I need to do a lot of organizing, planning, and co Hello, my name is Ana Laura. This is my studio in South London, where I live for the last 15 years. I need to do a lot of organizing, planning, and contacting people, so I spend a lot of time alone here sitting at the computer. This can feel like a contradiction, because my work is really about getting people to come together. The studio for community arts is also a place for meeting, for having coffee and talking for hours until common ideas start to develop. Because my projects take place over long periods of time and involve loads of different people, they can feel chaotic and hard to visualize. Sometimes it can feel like nothing is happening. I use a color-coded calendar to help me see how much time and how often I spend working on each project. It can be hard for people involved in my work to understand what is happening, especially not knowing what will be the final result. Most of the time, I don't know it myself. To help myself understand what is happening, I do a lot of mind mapping. This also helps me to remember when different people join in and what were their ideas and contributions to the project. Usually my work starts with a simple idea, with a curiosity or a very general theme. It can be nighttime, the history of a local political activist, or sometimes it's just asking questions about the place. Once there is a group of people interested in an idea, we start to do things together. Walking, talking, drawing, writing. These are some of the materials that were made by a group of mothers that came together to try to explain what was it like to have a baby with its good and bad moments. I like to use formats that can be reproduced many times so everybody can have their own copy to take home. With a group of mothers, we made this book that is now given to every woman that has a baby in our local maternity hospital. I like to think that at the end of each project, everybody involved has taken something out of it, opened their minds to new ideas, shared with others what they have and what they know, made some new friends and also made the world a nicer place for all. At the moment, I am working in a place where I live, Tals Hill Estate. Recently, I organized an open day for our community garden. I often work with other artists that also think that art is not just about exhibiting art objects, but it is more about creating healthy relationships with people. For the open day, artist Stella Gibbs brought her project Energy Cafe, a mobile kitchen that works with solar power and other off-grid energies. Tulsa Estate is a social housing complex that is owned by the local government. There are around 1,000 flats, so it has more or less the same population as Finn. 
People from all over the world live here, which makes it a very interesting place that is enriched by all these cultures coming together. On a material level, life is perhaps harder than in Finn. The neighborhoods came together to cook using food from our garden. These are some of the vegetables that we grow in the heart of London. So then it goes a little bit about me going to that village in Switzerland. So um, that I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense. And the thing is that from 2007, I stopped working on commission project and I decided that it was important for the, for the work that would happen um, within a uh, certain amount of control of what, for me, both in terms <laughs> of the, the time scale that I needed to, to work in the way that, I, that served the, per the political logic of the work, but also to reconnect it to the uh, early spirit, and that spirit that we started to work in the 90s that was to do with uh, being able to, to, to work in the world and to be artists in the world and to have a meaningful relationship between ourselves as artists and with the people around us and that in the process of coming through the institutions of art that has been lost and has been replaced by some other logic that it was quite perverse in terms of like time frames, uh, objectives, the targeting of like particular groups of people uh, and I find that that was uh, harmful to the work and also harmful to me, uh, to my health. And it was interesting that as I was talking about that, about this kind of like overworking of working in the project scale with these deadlines and this uh, need to finish things in a certain way at a certain time and wrap things and evaluate. And I think for me it was also important to regain a sense that um, that I uh, I had quality of life because I don't think my aims were altruistic. I wasn't out there doing this type of work because I wanted to save the world. It was because that's how I wanted to live, which is a different thing. So the logic that this work was killing me because I had to work in all these places and work in all these projects and respond to all these needs uh, was making me ill and it was uh, deteriorating my quality of life. So I thought moving the work out of the institution and in my uh, the places where I already live would uh, help my quality of life, will help the logic of the work. And also I read something quite uh, nice written by Boris Groys, uh, who he wrote about the project and how the project removes us from, our li from life. Because when we are working on the project, we are working towards this kind of like finishing moment of the project. So remove us from our contemporaneity. And I thought it'd be a, it was a paradox to have a practice that uh, meant to be social and meant to be involved with the people around me and at the same time I would be working with this project format that would remove me from living the life of the, with people around me. So all those things came together and I was like doing this, I started to move closer home and then from 2007 what I did is I decided to uh, just find out the ways of financing my life and uh, recovering the freedom to work in a different way. That took me to this idea of uh, working locally and uh, my doctoral research is, co is called Living Together the Artist as a Neighbor. And it's a practice based investigation of what happens with social uh, practice artists, or well, an artist, because what, one of the conclusions was that it's not something that is in intrinsic to social practice, that it has to do with an artist's choice to work locally, and that the place of production and creation and distribution of the work is all contained within a locality. Um, I thought that was like something particular to social practice, and my research actually took me to examples of artists that work with traditional media, but the same social dynamics are created around that, and it has to do with their commitment to uh, life in the community. So there are a few things there that are, are, interest, that are important. One is the inversion of the logic of participation. So the, the logic is not that I would create um, opportunities for people to participate in my work, but that I would participate in the life of the community with both as a neighbor and as an artist and find a way of making that that work. So it's, um, you know, just turning around the logic of participation. The other thing is to have something that would not work with the logic of the project, that would have a different dynamic, and that would mean that my quality of life would be better. So these are kind of like the things that, um, that I've been quite invested in, and um, let me just find my way here. So when, when I went to Swiss, Switzerland, I was quite interested because these guys were 
had moved into this village a few years ago and they were trying to put together this uh, program where they were commissioning artists to come and do projects in the village. And they were, you know, they, I thought they were trying to do something similar, which was to work in the place where they lived and to try to generate a context for contemporary art there. What happened is that actually <laughs> when I went, uh, what I discovered was that uh, they wanted to bring contemporary art to the village and they had made that interpretation that the best way to uh, sell contemporary art to non-specialized audience was social practice with no real understanding of what you know what is social practice about that is not just something to push contemporary art it's like an entry door to contemporary art for non-experts that was never the point uh, of working in that way, had a different political logic. But somehow, that is a result of the institutional, institutionalization and how the education departments have used social practice in a very instrumentalized way, precisely to do that, to outreach communities. And that's the, the starting point of the institutionalization of this practice, was education departments uh, commissioning pr artists that were working in community context to for somehow to make that link between what was happening in the gallery and what was happening outside. Um, so uh, what uh, I want to go now a bit to the kind of pedagogical things. Um, and uh, there is like two aspects to, the pe to talking about the pedagogical approach. On one hand would be to think about uh, what forms of learning take place through a kind of practice like mine. What is learned, who learns, and how. The other one would be how you learn to do this kind of work. Where do I learn to be a social art practice artist and how other people can learn this inside of the context of an arts institution. So let's start with whatever happens pedagogically in my work. Uh, Pablo Elguera's book uh, emphasizes the link between social practice and educational practice. Uh, since he's a, a professional educator, he admits the bias. Uh, but he insists that the student of socially engaged art uh, uh, would benefit from following ad and adapting methods and tools from the field of education. And he goes into some detail about that, although it's quite confusing in the book. At one point, he goes as far as to say that artists working in the field of social practice feel at home working in the context of education departments. Uh, of museums. Uh, my experience working in the context of education departments, that's a lot of harm to my practice. It doesn't help it and actually the best experience of working with institutions was working with the mainstream programming branch and not with the educational department. Although there are some brilliant people working in education departments, I think um, the logic that it works with is quite different from, um, from the one that I work. And, Thinking a little bit about this for this talk, I um, came to think that, in a sense, like Pablo Elguera, he was an artist that went to work in education. Uh, and he was like, I guess I've seen that a lot happen. Artists that have a practice, like, you know, kind of a more traditional practice, and then they, they do education work as a way of earning a living. There is a tension with those things, and I think some people have resolved it by uh, coming to this socially engaged practice, whether the experience of the, my experience and the experience of other people from my generation was that we have come to this through a more like a political, um, but more from being involved in grassroots politics and like feminist politics. And sometimes you find in education departments people that come from a political uh, activism background and they have a different mindset. Uh, and you, that, that's very evident, in, um, at least in the UK, in my experience in the UK. Um, so, you know, that's just to say that not all artists come to social practice from the same background, and that creates a different texture in the kind of work that they want to do and they are able to do, and the kind of like political thinking that informs it. So I just want maybe like to talk to you about some of the things that I have found difficult about working with educational uh, departments. Uh, and there is an emphasis on facilitation. The artist is somehow expected to facilitate opportunities for others to learn. Whatever it is, a new skill, to learn to appreciate art, learn to be creative, sometimes even to learn about their identity, their history, learn to develop self-confidence, social skills, I mean, it's infinite the list. But there is an expectation that the art is going to facilitate the learning of others. Um, there is also a preference for formats that can be planned, monitored, scheduled, you know, 
located in time and space and uh, you know the format of the workshop uh, theme discussions uh, games group exercises all that kind of like things that come from educational practice and i think that is kind of like somehow that tends to be pushed upon you uh, quite a bit and i find that that is absolutely um, something that i'm not able to do uh, although i have been kind of like put in the position of having to do these things and I eventually even became competent in doing these things. But it's something that it doesn't make sense to me for what I what are my intentions with the work. There is also an emphasis on evaluation and evaluating results, learning experiences and outcomes. Um, and also to do all that straight on the finishing line. I'm not against kind of assessing what happened. But I think that this kind of like the processes of people coming together and having an experience are uh, take a longer time. The sedimentation process might be longer. And in my experience, that happens to me, and I guess that it happens to other people. I had, an, uh, I had once uh, someone that rang me six months after a project had finished, and she told me she was very disappointed at the end of the project. And then six months later, she rang me and said, she's rang you to tell you that she's like, I understand now what happened. And it's great, and it was it's really good for me, and it has changed these things for me. But you know, I see if I evaluated right at the end point, uh, it would be a disappointment. It can be the other way around. Maybe someone is very excited straight on the finishing line, and like six months later, it's like, oh, who are you? I don't remember anything about you. Mm -hmm. So that kind of like the self-contained nature of the project, that you know, the, the institutional logic needs it. It's, it's also difficult for me. And the other thing that is quite, um, I guess, quite complicated for me to deal with is this idea of audience design. And Pablo Elguera talks about that. Uh, in particular, the thing of like uh, being <coughs> able to evaluate or to kind of like plan outcomes. And the idea of audience design are two of the things that he suggests that educational practice can offer social practice to make it better. And I really disagree with that. Uh, audience design it means um, kind of to tailor the activities or tailor what's happening to particular and use the com right communication methods to address the kind of like audiences, particular publics, so not to treat, like to think that what you are doing would be applied to anybody. So what is kind of like a critique of this side, you know, universalism, yeah, we are not all the same, I think is when it comes down to an institutional context, it turns into community profiling and demographic segregation. And I have come across that a lot in institutions that, well, you do work with children or with old people or with women or with, and there is always, it's all with a group of school kids. So that's kind of like, yeah, you are tailoring things to a particular audience, but in the process too, you are um, almost, uh, I don't know. I, I, I find that difficult. I don't I don't like to work in that way. I would I think uh, the work and my life benefits from being linked to all sorts of people and that people are not taken for a particular trait of their identity, which is not to deny their identity either. So I just show you hi what happened here. Sorry. I'll show you that uh, this uh, thing there is like a little exhibition display of a, a, a small project that was kind of commissioned by the South London Gallery. And they, I was working on a much longer project like, uh, that had to do with the, the history of a, of a local activist from my neighborhood and why, more widely with the history of black activists in South London in the 60s and the 70s. So they knew I was doing this thing and they approached me and they said, oh, would you do a workshop, uh, would you do a little project for for um, for us, and so we started to talk, and they, you know, it came down that they wanted, it, they were targeting it to young black women because the project dealt with black feminism, and they felt that, you know, and that's why I mean my community profiling that somehow the history of like black women activists would be relevant to uh, teenage black women. It's true, it's relevant to them, but just by force only for them, you know. So that's that's one thing. Then we started to design the. The project and my uh, response would be, well, let's just um, let them come and then we'll see. But that's not, <laughs> that's not possible. So we say, okay, well, it's gonna be for because they have to advertise it and they have to outreach and um, then they have to offer it in some form. And so it was like a war series of four workshops. And I thought, well, you know, I'll get started and then we'll we'll see. 
Um, and the, the girls came, a group of girls came, and there was an educator from the gallery, and she started to tell me off uh, because I wasn't using the right engagement methods. So she's going, oh, you need to use this kind of games because it's going really well with teenagers. And so I think that's kind of quite perverse, and in a sense, a practice that ex pre existed this type of uh, interventions now is not good anymore because <laughs> you know there's like methods designed for that so the first workshop just we went along we did it and then of course that thing was just another workshop and the second day there was uh, only two girls came and in the gallery they were quite busy this art educator wasn't around so i was left alone with the girls and i said oh you know what i found they were interested in like some some activists and i said you know there is a plaque for this um and there's like a blue plaque which is put in buildings to honor someone. I say, I found in the internet that that activist that you were interested in has a plaque just around the corner. Shall we go and look at it? So we left. And when we I turned there, there was no plaque. And the girl was, she's, she's a 14 year old, she was outraged. She was like, you know, how come the plaque is not here? If like, and we look in the internet and even, you know, it says that it has voted that the plaque would be put there and it wasn't there. And she was quite upset. So we went back to the gallery and we got some blue cardboard and went back to the square and made all these blue plaques saying, where is the plaque of Una Marson? We want the plaque here. And we just covered the whole square. This was not planned. This just happened because she wanted to do that. We come across that. And it was, it was much more meaningful. We learned a lot more about the process of local governance, why the plug was in there. Eventually, uh, you know, we took pictures and we sent them to the council and one year later they put the plaque up and there's a little picture of the plaque being unveiled one year later. So uh, then I, I kind of like went and to the gallery and said, listen, really, I just can't work in this way. Can I just have the girls come to my studio? And they say, oh yeah, because they quite like that little free experiment in the square. Uh, so what the rest of the workshop was that I was in my studio and the girls could come whenever they want and I had books and they just came and said oh we want to make these posters and I just helped them uh, to like technically resolve some of the issues and I made a poster myself so I did the same as they did and we had a set of four, four posters that were quite nice and, and became familiar with the history of these activists so that's some of the tensions, and to say that I have an excellent working relationship with Southern Gallery and the head of the education department is someone that I really uh, think is doing a great job. It's just the thing of the logics are at clash. So for me, it's not. Uh, so I turn sometimes down uh, invitations and institutions on the basis of that I'm not interested in doing institutional critique. I don't want to come in the institution and tell them the way that you work is wrong. No, the way they work is fine for the institution, it's just not fine for me. So it's unfair for them to have to deal with my rebellion, and it's unfair for me to try to comply to their modes of practice. So I think I better work outside, they better work inside, and we can have a good dialogue and collaborate in a different way. And that's the way I like to, um, to relate to institutions. So this idea, um, I often say that I have nothing to teach <laughs> when they say oh, you, you do a project, you know, like kind of educational project. Well, I, I really have, I can't teach anything, uh, which is not the same as to say that uh, in the process of working together, nothing would be learned. So to this idea of the artist as a critical pedagogue, I would, I prefer um, another concept that uh, was suggested to me as a metaphor for what I try to do as an artist, which is the, the concept of the public amateur. And this is something that was a term was coined by a writer called Claire Pentecost, and she's got a blog that I recommend that you, if you are interested in these things, you check. She uh, talks about uh, the public amateur, which is a figure that is not just art and artists, but also people that uh, engage in certain type of activity. And uh, she defines it as a person who consents to learn in public. Uh, and it's a, she says it's a proposition of active social participation in which any non-specialist is empowered to take the initiative to question something within a given discipline, acquire knowledge in a non-institutionally sanctioned way, and assume the authority to interpret that knowledge, especially in regards to decisions that affect his or her life. So 
when I there's a, a curator uh, called Anna Collin who was um, involved in you know some projects that I worked on, and she used that uh, that concept to to talk to talk about my practice in a in the introduction text for for a book uh, that she contributed to. Um, so I think I like this definition because I think it it points towards this idea of self interest, which is very important to me. I think. Um, I'm not the type of socially engaged artist that has a burning desire to give a voice to the voiceless, to empower the disempowered, or to um, liberate the oppressed. My motivations are a bit more uh, mundane and less novel, and it has to do with my quality of life and be able to kind of like to live a rich, meaningful life in the company of others. So I think that kind of like the philanthropic or altruist appro approach is not something that I feel uh, I don't identify with. Um, for me, it really the starting point to the work has to do with something that I need and I want and it's just not there in the world. And I often say that in that sense I'm a social realist. Um, and Eduardo Galeano, a Uruguayan writer, says that a realist is also someone that actively seeks to make real, to realize the things that they need in their life. And I quite like this idea that a realist is not someone pragmatic and say, well, this is what we have, but a realist is somehow someone that things, okay, we haven't got a tree here, we need it, let's go and get it. And I think that's a bit like the logic that I operate with. So for example, if I've been locked out of leaving the night because I had a baby and I've been uh, a mother and getting up at seven in the morning, I might go into an exploration of nighttime as an excuse to get out at night again. Uh, that might take me to talk to other people who have an investment an investment in the night to get them together, to listen to what they have to say and their experiences, whether they would be like women or people that uh, have a relationship to the idea of darkness from a spiritual or a creative point of view, uh, people that work in the night. So just uh, I would go out in the process of getting what I want and what I need. I would um, come across people that have information, that have skills, that have knowledge about the topic, and as a public amateur, I would try to learn from them. Uh, that complementarity, that they have things that I need, or that I want, and you know, they know things that I can help me, that makes that um, there is a complementarity that links us, and uh, that might lead to us uh, doing things together. And that's kind of like out of common interest, which is different from like selling the idea of a project to someone, which I've been in the position of doing, of having to go into a place and convince people to come and participate in my project. So that's a very different logic, that actually we end up doing things together because uh, there is a complementarity and they are invested in something that I'm invested to and interested. So we might, um, draw together and walk together and cycle together and do lots of things together. And this is another example which would be like my uh, interest in really becoming, uh, uh, understanding the history of the place where I lived and also reappraising uh, my entry into politics as a teenager and what that meant and how young women today might find a political voice and that took me into a kind of like trying to find out about the history of a local activist in my neighborhood that died quite young and she seemed to have left a remarkable community legacy but there was no documentation. That turned into like a huge five, six year long process of um, getting together with the people that knew her and have that history in their memory and with young women who wanted also to learn who this woman was. A little project that I talked to you about with the, the girls and the activists. There's a picture of um, us in the studio with the girls. So that kind of like, again, that brought us together to do all sorts of things, to uh, visit to the cemetery with family members and digging in archives and setting up a women's group <coughs> and having work, you know, studio sessions, making posters. Um, so that's kind of like a group of women that formed in the process of all getting around this uh, s search for the history of Olive Morris. Uh, bringing uh, Black Panthers from the United States to talk about their creative, the view of art and the creative activities and uh, um, campaigning for the reinstatement of 
the name of this activist in the you know local housing office putting together our oral history collection of uh, testimonies about that period it is uh, now uh, you know a, a, a quite a well uh, used archive on the history of black activism in the 60s and the 70s to do that we had to train ourselves as oral historians and archivists to organize events hold exhibitions organize talk talk talks and walks. So you see, it wasn't that I set out to create a project that would have loads of educational outcomes. It was just in the process of me trying to figure out <coughs> how that history was relevant to me as a neighbor, that just the whole thing starts to come together and people start joining and that drives the learning, like, you know, the, the, the need that we need to make certain things happen. Um, there is some more pictures there. So I now go back to this type of thing that I know. How do you learn it? How can can it be taught? How can it be taught within the context of an art school? There is um, this is quite a new field of educational practice. There's quite a few courses that are coming up here and there on social practice, which I really not very familiar with the curriculum and how how they are taught. But uh, Elgera's book is supposedly looking at some uh, recommendations of how what a curriculum for social for this type of work might look like um, he he waffles through the book he talks about lots of things that you know traits of social practice and how different uh, social sciences disciplines can contribute methods and tools and techniques to it but really it's on the last couple of pages that he commits and he goes okay a curriculum should look like that i thought the book was more you know, more based around, well, what would be the curriculum, but it's more like a description of social practice. And then come last page, there's the four points. And uh, where are we? Okay, so the first one. These are the four components that he thinks a curriculum uh, for an art school of social engaged parts should contain. A comprehensive <coughs> understanding of methodological approaches from social science disciplines like anthropology, ethnology, sociology, communication, psychology, education. Uh, I can tell you that I became a social practitioner without having no understanding of any methodological approach of any discipline whatsoever until I engaged in a PhD research, pro uh, research course because then the issue of methodology came to the forefront. And what I thought it was my methodology developed over many years and I became quite a whale old machine that I knew what I was doing and how to get what I wanted to get. Suddenly it wasn't uh, valid or in the UK there is a lot of pressure in, in kind of validating uh, practice-based research by resorting to the research traditions of the social sciences. So there's a lot of kind of high pressure in a way to find methodologies that are kind of replicable or that you can apply. And what we end up doing is like finding something that looks a little bit like our method of working and doing like some kind of jamming. So that kind of like became familiar then with things that have been useful for me, like ethnography. I have find things like similarities and things interesting, not from educational practice, not from sociology, so that's quite interesting because I think every social practitioner, social art practitioner has a particular slant and they will be more uh, close to certain other disciplines. And that kind of like varies a lot. For me, um, anthropology probably is like the closest, although I have loads of issues <laughs> with anthropology. But uh, there is something about kind of like this idea that uh, it comes up again that methodological approaches and tools from social sciences are particularly apt for social practice. And although I find that it's interesting, I don't think they're essential. And I think actually social sciences are much more interested in how we work and there is a lot more for them to, to learn. And that has been said to me by sociologists and anthropologists when that, they see like the kind of work that I do, they go, oh, that's a really interesting methodology. You can get to, to people's in a way that we cannot get. So I think that's kind of like, it's quite an interesting thing that we look to them for methodology, but there might be like more, a much more equalitarian relationship that could happen. There are also the whole thing about visual research methods. They are like so based on textual research methods and they are really trying to grapple with 
other sen sensorial type of data like sound or image, which we are kind of like more expert at decoding and reading. So um, it, it would be good if um, this kind of hierarchy that we have to learn from them would be like, you know, leveled out. There is also a suggestion that um, the possibility of adapting and reconfiguring the curriculum according to the interests of the student, I think we kind of like, that's something that in general most um, contemporary art courses tend try to do at least, which is to think uh, rather than put people through sculpture, painting installations, try to say, okay, what is it that you are interested in? And then we can uh, provide you with a lot of options on how to um, develop your interest. I was, we were visiting the school, the art school here. Jeremy was showing around, showing us around, and I think like that's a bit of like the gist of how art education happens. Uh, and it links to this idea of which other fields of knowledge uh, and practice are connected to what you are trying to do. There is also a suggestion that art history and art te techniques are also taught, and, but particularly those that have converged into social practice, um, but also to teach the history of how they have been taught. So for example, if you learn uh, craft, the methods of crafts, you learn that, but also how at a particular time point in history those were thought, or you know, the Bauhaus and design theory, color theory, why and how they were taught and how those educational models made sense in a particular context. I have a lot of art training, quite traditional, as a cr in crafts, as I say, I'm a woodcarver and a gilder, and I train in all the sculptural techniques. Um, I also have uh, quite a lot of training in, I did a master's in, um, in London in critical finance practice, so that was quite heavy on theory, critical uh, thinking, performance, uh, conceptual art. Um, and I think that all those things have converged and I, I made good use of that. I think that it's kind of like a tendency now, especially uh, with the, the depletion of resources in art education, that it's quite easy to get rid of the workshops. <laughs> it's just let's all be conceptual artists <laughs> and work in a little room with nothing on it. So there is a de-skilling and it's kind of like a we cannot forget and say, oh, well, you know, you don't need to learn to draw, you don't need to learn color theory uh, to be an artist. I think that it's something to be said for those things, and I think it's important. I think it teaches you lots of things, how to look, um, and although social practice might not be materialized into an art object, there is a sense of form there, but it's quite complex, it happens in 4D, but there is a sense of harmony too, there is something, and also like understanding what the aesthetics are, not just as a kind of like something to do with sensorial input, but also uh, that kind of like under more contemporary understanding of aesthetics as a system of disruption, of opening up new reg regimens of the sensible, which is kind of something that Rancière has written and I think is quite a, an interesting concept. Finally, he um, suggests that there is an experiential approach to learning in the real context where the world will take place. And that is, I think, true from all art education, that when you are in art school, you are doing all this art in this vacuum, and then the real world is not like that, and it's quite tough. In the case of social practice, I mean, there's just no way that you can practice that inside of the art school unless you do some kind of like convivial stuff with your students, which is fine. And I guess that the first social project that I did was actually during my May, which I did a, I did the final show piece that was just a room for my classmates to hang out in 1996, and that was quite difficult to sell as an art project to my teachers. Um, but we had this idea of like, you know, uh, community, you know, creating a community. If uh, I look at those four things, I can see how these things have come into my training at different points, but there are a couple of things uh, that are not there. Uh, and, and coming to an end, those were worries. One is a political education. I think for me, that's kind of like the bedrock of what I do is that I was lucky enough to get a wonderful political education from very young. When I came uh, of age as a teenager when the dictatorship finished in Uruguay, it was a time of great political effervescence because suddenly 
the military was gone, and it was like an idea that we can reconstitute democracy, and people were coming out of jail and coming back from exile, and it was a very fermental time to be involved in politics, to be involved in the student movement, uh, to be involved in like youth, the youth movement that was like fighting repression against young people. Uh, then uh, I left Uruguay, I went to Spain, I was involved in the solidarity with Central America movement. So I had always had like a very uh, grounded political grassroots practice. And I would think that most of the things that have been useful for me to social practice come from that political education that was greatly enhanced by that Olive Morris project where I got a second round of political education from the Black Caribbean, which has a fantastic tradition of political thought and action. So when I talk about political education, I talk both about a theoretical political education and a practical. The theoretical would be to understand how power operates. And I think if you are a social practitioner and you don't understand the dynamics of power, you are going to do a very poor service to yourself and to the people that you work with. And I would think that Gramsci should, should be like compulsory reading to anybody that goes into this type of work. So H.P. Newton too, um, but also a practical uh, uh, training, a practical political education in self-organization, in what mu mutual aid involves, which uh, would do quite a lot to go against this logic of uh, philanthropy or, you know, that is kind of like embedded in the institutional art system. At least in the UK, all arts institutions were founded as philanthropic endeavors. So when you try to bring social practice in that context, you are going from a position of trying to talk about mutual aid, about self-organization, and you are coming across the logic of um, philanthropy, which is not a charity. It's not. It's a different thing. I always say to my daughter, you know, we don't do charity, we do social justice. <laughs> that, that kind of imaginary. And then the other thing is uh, the intergenerational exchange. Uh, the, the, probably the other main source of education for me as an artist, as a social practitioner, was the opportunity to be with older artists and with younger artists. Uh, from the older, you get a sense that it's worth doing this and that it's worth not compromising and not selling off. And it's worth uh, not having your hair done and not having much money and um, sometimes overworking because what you are doing is exciting and you can always change it and you can always do something new. And that there, there is something that you are carrying forward which is different. This sense of, you know, that you learn who you are as an artist not just because you read the books and you say, oh, you know, Duchamp, but no, there's like someone that is quite close to you that has left a mark and has made some things and have been having that opportunity. And I think that's what is great about social practice, how it was, is that because it was not taught in school, you have to go and look for people who did something like you were trying to do and learn from them directly. And it wasn't that they told you, oh, you do this and that. It was more a sense of values and an attitude. Uh, like, you know, what kind of atti attitude and values would guide you and would su support you? We had lots of, with all their artists, we had lots of disagreements about lots of things. You know, they thought, for example, that what we were doing was not art, uh, that um, we have completely blown up the division between art and life, uh, they accuse us of being non-artists, but still there was a lot of solidarity and a lot of support and a lot of kind of like, well, you are our younger generation. And I feel very much like that uh, with younger artists that come uh, me because there is no, it's not taught in art schools. What happens is if you go and give a talk or someone sees your work, you get I get a lot of requests from younger artists, art students say, can you talk to me about my work? And I show you my work. I always tell them, go to your school and tell them to hire me to give you a tutorial because I really resent that just because they don't provide that kind of education, we ended up doing it for free outside. But on the other hand, that's how I learn because someone had the generosity of spending time with me. So you say that and then you always meet them and talk to them. And um, the image there is uh, because one of such things is like Anne Bean, which is a performance artist, she's in her 60s now, who in a, in a gathering of performance artists of the different generation, the last day she gave all the younger women artists a bag, a very nice bag. That's not the one she gave us, it's from Google. But she say, since you are kind of like bent on doing this type of work, you're always gonna, you're, you're gonna be like quite close to a bag lady. 
you know so you made you better doing this style so here is a bag for you and um and the things that i have learned from not just all the artists but also artists of my generation are very very valuable and sometimes they are kind of like tools and techniques and approaches but a lot of times it's just something to do with kind of like quite basic values to go about and Recently, uh, a younger artist, German artist uh, in London that I consider a good friend and someone that, you know, um, didn't train as a social artist but has a practice <coughs> that com can be called social. She created a garden and gave it my name and it was a very nice, uh, it was a nice homage because she created it in the neighborhood that I left to go to Uruguay and uh, she made quite a bit of a thing of it. But she sent me a picture, she said, I left a book for her with like some, you know, I thought with like some tips um, for a younger artist. And I forgot everything about it. And she made the, some bounty. Uh, and she wrote them, and I, I remember. So the things that I, <laughs> this is like the teaching. <laughs> uh, work hard, don't compromise, don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> so there were three things. So uh, this is how we learn, this is how we teach. Thank you. or new institutionalism, um, whether institutions, art institutions can kind of change from the inside and they can structurally develop so they can accommodate different forms of practice. I'm just thinking of the different institutions I've worked with. Mm. They're very diverse and there are some institutions which are less monolithic. Um, I think there's a big difference with, with the size, no? Like, I've, uh, the bigger the institution is, the harder it is somehow to to like change. Uh, I find that like, smaller organizations can change and can adapt more quickly. Uh, but then what I'm saying is true, that sometimes in big, in big institutions, you cre they are like these like, uh, empty holes of vacuums of power, and then if you are very active, you can just like jam them in. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they change and they are responsive. I had this conversation lots of time with Cynthia Griffins, who was a Tate Modern. She's kind of like community regeneration manager, and she commissions a lot of community projects for Tate Modern. And I have a very good um, intellectual relationship with her. She has tried to commission me many times, and we've always come to this point in which the, the, what I want to do cannot be accommodated. And she says, well, you know, we need artists to come and help us, like, push the boundaries. And in that, I'm a bit, like, uh, you know, I get a bit radical there because I think they are smart enough to make the changes themselves. I don't think we should be, uh, you know, coming in and, you know, like, uh, going through the stress and making them change. It's a bit like, you know, the thing of, well, we have the 90s, we have the cultural identity politics. Well, now everybody knows about that. But we have to still do the work. No, you know, the, the construction tools are there, they all know about them, so if you're not ready to stop being a misogynist or a racist, it's not my problem to re-educate it. We've done that, it's just gone. So I think, I, I don't want to do it. You know, they are smart people. They can just do the changes themselves. They're getting paid by the institution to do the changes. I don't want to come as an artist, poorly paid, to kind of like, you know, push them and, you know, yeah, like, come on, let's change. They can do it themselves, and there are other artists that are younger and have more stamina to <laughs> to take that. I did it for seven years. <laughs> no, I did my bit. Have I think there are some institutions that have that work better, and for me, it has to do with the person that is at the helm and with the political education that person has. I think, for example, I'm talking about London a lot because you know that's the context I know. The South London Gallery has been able to do interesting things because she's got Frances Williams, who has a background in the queer politics from the 80s. So she's someone that has a radical political mind, and she knows what she's doing when she goes out in, in a community context. And she won't. But then there are, you know, if you come like, you know, like you are a philanthropist at the helm of a department. But that's not my view, you know. I think for some people it's fine. That's what the world is about. Not everybody is coming from the same political position. Uh, there is also like people that are, 
happier with educational models of practice. It's just, you know, it's not a manifesto for that everybody should do what I do. This is how I work because it makes sense to my life uh, uh, experience and what I, how I want to live. But it's not dogma. You know, I'm not going to go around like shooting socially engaged artists. <laughs> Some of them do nice works too. <laughs> Well, before 2007, I did, um, it was like kind of like different periods. Before 2001, we were just working in our, where we were as such, because the concern was not to work with communities, it was just to find a place, a place to work and to, to do what we wanted to do. Uh, and the art institutions weren't providing that, we weren't interested in, in, in the kind of like installation or you know gallery work. So we were just working where we lived because that was like handy and we could just be there and use the streets and coffee shops and our back room. So the, the concern at the time was with that. So it wasn't really thinking about community or engagement or you know doing something with or for the community. That was not the issue, it's just we were there. Then, uh, when the practice starts to get institutionalized, we start getting commissioned by institutions. I think they are like, they are the ones that, you know, kind of like came from there to say, yeah, there is a community that you have to engage. And a lot of the strategies for engagement came from the mandate of the institution to go and work with this group and that group. And then you have to kind of like figure out a way of how to do it. Uh, from 2007, as I say, I kind of like decided that I didn't want to work anymore like this. I did, I'm, you know, I liked some of the works I did, and I think they were kind of successful in lots of levels, and some good things happened. But it was just um, a bit forced, really. And I wasn't interested in engaging uh, the community or helping others. I'm just not interested in that. So the thing of like working where I live, for me, it addresses better my self-interest because I just work in my neighborhood and then if it gets nicer and better, well, it's good for me, I live there. So if like this, if you are involved in the life of the school of your child and in the governance of it, the school would be better and you benefit because your child is there. Other children benefit too, but you and your child too. So I work from that logic. And what is good for me is that not to have like a, <coughs> a big idea at the beginning. It's more like, well, I want this, you know, like this. There was a, an abandoned garden. I just want to have, I want to grow vegetables. So I just start doing it, and then other people would come along, or I would go and say, oh, you know, they told me you know how to plant carrots. Can you come and teach me? And it comes more from, it's a lot more improvised now, and that's how I like to work, and that's how. So it doesn't come from, what it's true is that uh, it's not just like, oh, let's come along. Uh, there is a sense of uh, aesthetic direction in the sense that I like to to take things out to the common place of community work too. Because what happens a lot in kind of community situations is that there is a tendency to the celebration, to celebrate how great we are, how happy we are, and how good things are and a tendency to kind of like shy away from conflict sometimes, although conflict is all over the place, the dynamics of communities are like, the dynamics of our family, you all have families, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but there is that, you know, the same thing like when the family, when kind of like a, a big celebration comes, we are all like, great, and then <laughs> the same thing happens in the community, they're just big families. So I think for me, it may be like the inflection that I can bring to that participating in that life as an artist is to somehow like just push to kind of like deal with some things that you know that otherwise we won't deal with or uh, but I think it, uh, it's, it's uh, you know it's so easy to kind of like dismiss or like put aside the things that are difficult so I guess I'm just interested in how you can actually live with that and and 
make it explicit. And that's what I was talking about, this idea of frontier of the aesthetic as um, something that has to do with like a jamming or like an opening up or, or, of something that wasn't there before. Um, so that is, that is something that is quite there. It's, there's a bit of like engineering there, but it's not. Uh, but it doesn't direct the whole thing, because I think what is important for me is that everybody finds uh, that happened with Oli Morris project, and that was kind of the first thing, th time it actually happens in a project really strongly, is that people became so uh, so much the authors and the owners of that thing that uh, they saw it as their thing, and it had nothing to do with me or with art or anything. So there were people that felt that it was their project, it was an oral history project, or people that thought it was kind of like a educational project or whatever and we all coexisted with that it was just one big thing but everybody approached it from their interest and it would and, and it could ha it happen so i don't need to prescribe that this is art you know i see it as art because that's, i'm coming from art but other person can see it as gardening because they come from gardening and um that i can live with that